Uh, we'll start off with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us today. Thank you for the people who are willing to wait and to listen to your word. Lord, we pray that you will guide our thoughts today and help us to understand your will and your plans and your actions in this world. Amen. Amen. I'm going off piste today, as they would say in skiing circles. This isn't going to be about the book of Acts. Um, it's about a subject I've already covered in others, but given recent events in Israel and other places, I thought I ought to do it again. And specifically what I want to study is modern Israel in the Bible. So what the Bible says about the events that are happening now in Israel. There's a question the world is asking. Are you on the side of the Palestinians or are you on the side of Israel? And you can tell what someone's side is, but whether they call it Israel or whether they call it Palestine. And there's this question. Are you on Israel's side? Are you on Palestine's side? That's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. And what I want to do is show you in the Bible what is going on in the background. And then hopefully you'll understand what I mean by that. If you want to start, turn to Genesis. We'll start with God's word. Genesis 13. This is to Abraham, or Abraham, I think, as he was at the time. And it's God's promise. So it's Genesis chapter 13, and it's verse 14 onwards. And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, this is where God, uh, Abraham gives Lot a choice. If, if you want that area, I'll have that area. If you want that area, I'll have that area. Lot decides on the best bit which unfortunately is a place called Sodom and Gomorrah, and heads off in that direction. So Abraham's left laying in this sort of more desert area. Uh, now, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northwards, southwards, eastwards, and westwards, which, by the way, also covered the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make, um, make your descendants like the dust of the earth. So if anybody can number the dust of the earth, your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its breadth, for I will give it to you. And Abraham moved his tents and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which is our at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. That's an unconditional promise, an eternal promise unconditional promise. Problem. Who was Abraham's oldest son? Ishmael. What countries descend from Ishmael? The Arab countries. Uh, Islam counts uh, Ishmael as their father. Abraham by Ishmael. They even changed scripture to say that it was Ishmael who was offered on the, uh, the altar and not Isaac. Let's see what the Bible says on the subject. Go to Genesis chapter 21, 9 to 13. Bit of a rough passage in some ways. And you can see why there's some animosity between the Arab nations and Israel. Because it started back here. Yes. Um, 21, 9 to 13. Ishmael was about 13-ish, 14-ish, already at this stage. And suddenly Isaac gets born. Ishmael was born by um, Hagar, who was an Egyptian slave, who Sarah married off to, um, to Abraham to try to, as it were, fulfil the promise, because that was the rules in those days. If the wife can't have a baby, she can take one of her maids. That maid can have a baby on her, her behalf for her husband, and then that baby becomes hers. Didn't work out very well, as you can expect. And when Isaac is born, things go wrong. Now, Sarah saw 
the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of the maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And the matter displeased Abraham greatly because, he, because of his son. Abraham loved Ishmael. And God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad uh, and, the maid, and the maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. And the son of the maid will be made into a nation also because he is your descendant. And Ishmael gets chucked out. And God gives a prophecy early on about Ishmael. He says he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against all his brothers and all his brothers will be against him. And the story of the Arab nations, most of them spent all their time fighting each other. And it was only just before the Second World War that a chap called Lawrence of Arabia got them all to agree together against a common enemy, which was the Turkish Empire. And they all got together and attacked the, the, the Turkish Empire. In, and even nowadays, even with the, the, the countries that basically the West almost set up after World War I, the Arab countries, even now they still spend most of their time fighting each other. The only time they don't is when they're fighting Israel. If you want to get unity, find a common enemy. That's how it works. So, God says specifically here that the promise will be via Isaac. Let's go to the words of David in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles. This is one of David's psalms that's not in the book of Psalms. And it's when the, the ark would be brought into Jerusalem for the first time and, and set up in a tent in Jerusalem. And David has a psalm and it's uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 13 to 18. Does somebody else want to read this one for me? Uh, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 13 to 18. O descendants of Israel, his servants, O sons of Jacob, his chosen one. Can you read him right there? Yep. He is, the Lord, he is the Lord our God, whose judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, and the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. That seems fairly fairly definite to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob promise has all been made this land is yours forever, a thousand generations, I don't think we've reached a thousand generations yet but there are conditions on some pre um, presents go to Deuteronomy in the book of Deuteronomy chapter um, 29 and, and 30 there is a, a separate covenant. It used to be known in theological circles as the Palestinian covenant. It was a, 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 a promise God made about the land of Palestine, they used to call it in the old days. Unfortunately, along come the PLO and they made up their own Palestinian covenant, which basically meant the complete destruction of Israel. So it, it's got changed, the name's got changed to the land covenant. And this isn't an unconditional covenant. This is a conditional covenant. This is a set of rules that God lays down. Um, so, verse 10 to 20 of verse, uh, chapter 29. I'll read this one. This is God speaking via Moses to the people of Israel. You stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs of your tribes, your elders, your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, the aliens, that doesn't mean little green men, that means strangers, that means foreigners, who are within your camps, for the ones who chop your wood to the ones who draw your water. So that includes the slaves. Everybody this is the agreement with. That you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into the oath 
which the Lord your God is making with you today, in order that he may establish your, uh, you today as his people, and that he may be your God, just as he has spoken to you and as he swore to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. <clears throat> Not now with you only am I making this covenant and this oath, but also with those who are not standing with us today in the presence of the Lord your God, uh, with those who are not with us here today. Any idea what that means? Future generations. So this is, an, uh, this is a, a, a conditional covenant with future generations as well. For you, now, uh, for you know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. Moreover, you have seen the abominations and their idols of the wood and stone and silver and gold which they, um, which they, have, uh, which they had with them. Lest there be among you a man or woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away from me and from the Lord your God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there be a root of bearing poisonous fruit of wormwood. And it shall be when the heart, um, when he hears the word of this curse, because there's curses in the law, there's blessings, there's cursings. Um, and he will say and boast, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to destroy the watered land with the dry. What have you got for that last verse? And from the I don't entirely understand this bit, but it certainly means that the good land with the bad land will be destroyed. Well, it says bad, so it's not. Yeah. Water, yeah. Dry yeah. So. So verse 20, and the Lord will never be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man and, e and ev every curse which is written in this book will rest upon him and the Lord will blot him out from his name under heaven. That's a conditional promise. If you go back to idolatry, I will blot you out. This land is yours, but if you go to idolatry, I will blot you out from this land. And I will destroy your land, the good and the bad. I will destroy it. This in some ways is a conditional covenant. Imagine a child who's misbehaving. One of the, uh, in the old days, not that I do that anymore. One of the things you can do, your favourite toy, give that to me. That's going in the cupboard. When you behave, you can have it back. Nowadays, that's the mobile phone. You can have your phone back when you behave. <laughs> this is God saying to the people, this land's yours, it's yours forever. But if you misbehave, I'm taking it away from you. And the, the next section along, from 20 onwards, or 21 onwards, sorry, then the Lord will single at him out for adversity from all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant which are written in this book. Now the, gen now the generations to come, your sons will rise up after you and foreigners who come from distant lands and they will see the plagues of the land and the diseases uh, which the Lord has afflicted with you and will say, all the land is brimstone and salt and burning waste, unsown and unproductive, so that no grass will grow in it, like Sodom and Gomorrah and Ab Adam and, Z and Zobahar, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. And all the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to his land? Why this great outburst of anger? And the Lord, and the men shall say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made for them <coughs> and brought them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they served other gods and they worshipped God, the gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord came against the land to bring upon it every curse which was written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from the land in his anger and in his fury and in his great wrath and cast them into another land as it is to this day. 
The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe his law. That's what happened at the first exile to Babylon. They were worshipping other gods, idols. And they were literally thrown out into Assyria to start with, and then to Babylonia and spread around the place. Let's go on to, 31, or to chapter 30. So it shall be, when all these things have come, come upon you, the blessings and the curses which I set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all the commands that, the, that I command you today, and to your sons, that the Lord your God will restore you from captivity, will have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you, if... Um, if your outcasts are to the ends of the earth, there the Lord um, your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. So if you misbehave, I'm chucking you out. If you repent, I will bring you back. <clears throat> that happened at the Babylonian exile, and they come back at the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, and Zerubbabel. It also happens after... Jesus had been rejected. Now that wasn't because they were worshipping idols, they weren't. Not physical idols, but they were worshipping spiritual idols. They were worshipping power. They were worshipping the tradition of the elders, church tradition, Jewish tradition. They were worshipping money. They were worshipping all these things and when God came to them, they rejected him. And so the exile at 70 AD, when they were Israel, the temple was destroyed, was according to this because they weren't worshipping God. They were worshipping idols, whatever they may be. Let's go to Exodus 34. There's a verse I just want to show you here because I think it's interesting. You probably want to keep a bookmark in Deuteronomy. We're probably going back there quite a bit. Exodus 34. I found this little verse and it gave me a wry, a wry smile given what's happened in the world at the moment. Thirty-four and it's verse twenty-four. This is after the um, the feasts of Israel have been mentioned. So God's told them about the various different feasts. And three are they called pilgrimage festivals where they come up, to, come up to Jerusalem and they worship at that festival. And so if we go to verse 24. This is God speaking by Moses. For I will drive out the nations before you and enlarge your borders and no man will covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. No man will covet your land. No man will want your land. I don't think that's true at the moment, is it? No. That was based on obedience to the, the festivals. The Israel has returned. Israel has returned. But it's not because they've turned back to God. 20% of Israel are Orthodox or ultra Orthodox, who are the descendants of the Pharisees. And they are obsessed with, with the, the Bible, obsessed with the, their traditions. The rest, 80% of Israel, half of that is nominally Jewish. They wear the kippahs, they do the, the feasts and things like that, but it's like the C of E, we're sort of nominally Christian in some senses. They call themselves Christian. 40% are atheists, agnostics, don't want anything to do with it at all. So the majority of Israel as such is, yeah. It's a small uh, messianic. Yeah. There is a very, very small messianic group within Israel. That is what's known as the remnant. In, in theological circles, that's what's known as the remnant. Those Jews who actually believe in the Messiahship of Jesus. 
the ultra-Orthodox are so inward-looking, they're hated by other people in Israel. They don't do military service. They don't work because the men have got to spend their time studying the Torah. So they don't do any work. So the, the state has to support them. The women get sent out to work. That's another matter. They, they pay less taxes because they hold the balance of power in their proportional representation system. So they've managed to get all these uh, special deals on them. So they don't have to do national service. They don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to work. The rest of the population hate them. They loathe them. And these are the ones who are pouring on the Bible all the time, looking at it. The Torah. The Torah. The Torah. Yeah. Old Testament Bible. So the overall people in Israel are not back in Israel because they have repented. So the question is, how do they get back? Why are they back in the land? What God's condition was, if you repent, I'll bring you back. But they're back. And there's a couple of uh, verses I've got down here. In Numbers, we won't look it up. When, the peop when God rejects the people of Israel, when they refuse to go up the first time in to take the land, and he sends them out for 40 years in the wilderness, there's a group of them says, we'll change their mind, we'll go back. And Moses says, don't do it, because they go up there and they get... They get their butts whipped, basically, and get chucked out. The, the passage in Daniel, that's down there, but Daniel 11, it talks about men of violence who try to fulfil the vision. Now, that is specifically returning to the, the Maccabees, the Maccabee Rebellion, uh, which is when the Greeks were in charge, a, a priestly family grew up and started a rebellion because they wanted to set up the kingdom of Israel. They wanted to chuck these enemies out and set up a king again. And it was, the Maccabees, I believe, even today, have a complicated relationships in Judaism. Some of them see them as heroes, some of them see them as villains. Um, it describes them as men as violence. James, there's one verse there which says, The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. That was given in a different, uh, different context, but the principle is the same. Man's anger, man's wrath, doesn't achieve God's righteousness. So the anger of Israel, justified, doesn't necessarily achieve God's righteousness. Let's go to 1 Peter, though. 1 Peter. Famous, famous verse, 1 Peter 4.17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome? For those who do not obey the gospel of God. When God starts judgment, the first thing he does is puts his own house in order. And that will be with the church. The amount of persecution that's going on around the world at the moment, it's like a shaking see which ones stay on the tree and which ones fall out and in the church of england at the moment and the which ones will stay and the baptists which ones will stay on the tree and which ones will fall off there is a judgment and the same judgment applies to israel let's go to ezekiel this is the um ezekiel 20 <coughs> This explains the modern state of Israel and what it's there for and why God has organised its return. Because God has organised its return, though not in faith. This is Ezekiel 20, 33 to 37. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath outpoured, I will be king over you. I shall bring you out of the peoples and gather you from, um, from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath outpoured. And I shall bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I shall enter into judgment with you face to face as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt. I will enter into judgment with you 
declares the Lord God. And I shall make you pass under the rod, and I shall bring you into the bond of the covenant. This is being called in to see the headmaster. This isn't a return with joy, this is a return for judgment. And the events of the First World War brought about Zionism, a non-religious organisation that brought the people back. First people who came back to Israel were communists. The kibbutz were set up on communist ideals. It was not a religious return. And afterwards, after the, the Holocaust, the wrath of the Holocaust, God brings his people back in wrath to the land of Egypt, the land of Israel, not in belief. And the anti-Semitism around the world is having the effect of driving the people out of countries. Yeah. And the Arab world is it, almost like ethnic, well it is ethnic cleansing. The Jews, there were thousands upon thousands of Jews in Iraq and Iran, they ain't there now. They're either dead or they've been driven out to Israel and in Russia and in Africa and in Europe. You know, um, anti-Semitism in this country has gone up 1,000% since the attack by Hamas. That's in this country. And so the people of Israel are being driven out of the world and the only place they can go to is Israel because at least there they can pick up a gun and defend themselves. So they're being driven there <coughs> for judgment. For judgment. I'm going to make a quick jump here and you'll probably wonder why in a while. The Feast of Tabernacles, known as Sukkot, yeah. the Feast of the Little, um, happened a little while ago in Israel. That's the feast where they're all supposed to live outside in little huts. And it's to remind them of the time they were in a foreign land, they would exile, and then they come into the land. But it's also to remind them of the, the blessings of God, because they decorate these things with fruits, and it's like a harvest festival. Seven-day festival, set up in Leviticus. You can look it up if you want to, we're not going to. Seven-day festival. And then, in Numbers, God adds an eighth day. This weird eighth day at the end of it. That doesn't, God doesn't really say what it's for in the Bible. It's an eighth day of solemn assembly. And now the way it works, the first day of Sukkot, whatever it is in the week, is a special Sabbath. The last day is a special Sabbath. Somewhere in between you'll have another Sabbath or so. And then you've got the eighth day. That's a special Sabbath. And because God hasn't said much about it, the rabbis have added loads of stuff in. The rabbis like adding loads of stuff in. And firstly, they have the, the Hoshanah. They have a pulpit in the middle of their synagogues. And for each day of the um, Feast of Tabernacles, they march around this pulpit once, waving palm leaves and other leaves in their hands, four, four different types of palm leaves. They march around it praying. And they do that for six days, and on the seventh day, the uh, um, Rabban Hoshanah, see if I can get it right, uh, Rabban Hoshanah, which means the great Hosanna. They march around it seven times. What does that remind you of? Jericho. Jericho. Seven times. And that's their idea in their mind, because the, the ultra-Orthodox think this is the day when God's going to make his judgment. And judgment is going to be settled on this day. This is the day we've got to break down a wall, the wall between us and God. It's an iron wall. We've got to get through to God and is it like it's a last, a last appeal. This is our last appeal to God for judgment for the new year. And that's their idea. And so they march around seven times as Hoshanah, praying for repentance, praying for healing. On the, the next day, the eighth day, it's a special day to them. They, Shemechat uh, Torah, whatever that means. The, the first bit means the, the, cele um, the celebration of Torah, the celebration of the, the scripture. Now the, the Jews, the, the, the ultra-Orthodox, have a, a lectionary reading, the same as we do. So in the C of E you have a lectionary reading, you're supposed to read certain passages each day. Their lectionary reading starts and ends on the eighth day. And what they do, they, they read the last chapters of Deuteronomy, last two chapters, and the first chapter of Genesis on the same day. 
So the idea is it's like a continuous circle. And the last two chapters, well, the last chapter of all is the death of Moses, but the chapter before that is the blessings. The blessings poured out on Israel for obedience. And so this is the great day, the celebration. And so the ultra-Orthodox, uh, in order to prepare for this great day, they will spend the entire night beforehand reading the book of Deuteronomy. So they'll all stay up, they'll be reading the book of Deuteronomy, they'll be reading the book of Psalms, all in preparation for the next day when they read the last few chapters, and it all starts again. And they read the chapters we've just read, the land covenant. That's some of their lectionary readings for that time. So this is their understanding. And the idea is, if you keep these covenants, then no one will want your land. If you stay away from idolatry, God will be on your side. If you don't, I will chuck you out of the land. If you behave, I will bring you back into the land. All these things, they're busily reading those. And they won't go out. They won't look outside. Because if they see a car driving on a special Sabbath, that, that contaminates them. So any car that you see driving around on the Sabbath contaminates you. They won't even look out. It's all inward looking. There was another group of people on the, this particular day this year who were driving around. Because obviously, as I said, 40% are completely secular. They're not interested in any of this stuff. Um, so it was on the Thursday they started. Oh, sorry, on the Friday. And it was coming up to sunset on the Friday. And that was the, the Friday was the, the last day of the seven days. And so the, the Saturday <coughs> was the eighth day. In Israel, the eighth day starts on sunset. So it's Friday. So at sunset on Friday, the eighth day starts. What also starts on sunset on Fridays in Israel? Shabbat. Shabbat. These youths were getting text messages. And the text message that goes to this location, and they were washed over there, and they got another one, go to this location, go to this location, go to this location. And it's part of the fun of getting to a rave, because you don't know where the rave is set up. It's like a party, dance without what we would call music. It's just a beat, and they just boogie to the beat all night long. And they're like raves the world over. So when you get there, you drink a lot, you take drugs, probably nip off somewhere to have sex. It's a standard Western style rave. And these people were running around on the Friday night of Sabbath, on the great day, looking for the rave. They got there about 10 o'clock and they partied through the night. If you look at the picture of TikTok, TikTok, my, my daughter asked, why have you got a TikTok picture on there? <coughs> That's a picture of that rave. You will all have seen this rave because the bit you would have seen will be a few minutes, seconds later, when the image turns around and looks into the distance and sees parachutists and rockets and people running for their lives. When you look at that picture, what do you see? I see a Buddha. A Buddha. A Buddha. Yes. <clears throat> Gosh. They were dancing around a Buddha oh, in the wilderness. What does that remind you of? What happened in Israel's history? For that much. Now, that's not, they're not worshipping it. That is so much sect decoration. It's, to, it's just there to look cool, to look Western, to look New Age, to look whatever it's going to be. It's just there. It's not really an idol you bow down to. But here you have the young people in Israel on the eighth day, on the Sabbath, dancing around an idol. Am I saying that's why the attack happened? No. But is that symbolic of why the attack happened? Yes. And so that's when Hamas chose to attack. When the young people in Israel were dancing on an idol. They didn't attend the three festivals. And the ultra-Orthodox were hiding in there a little bit. It's interesting, that day is when the blessings were supposed to be read out. I wonder how many synagogues actually had time to read the blessings out that day. The blessings on Israel. I believe all the... Um, what do they call it? Where, where the people also mostly were killed. Yeah. What are they? The kibbutz. 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 They're normally 
religious. Yeah. It's interesting that all the kibbutz that were attacked were what they would call liberal Israelis. They weren't the, they weren't the ultra-Orthodox. They weren't the, the settlers. They were people in favour of peace. They were people who drove Palestinian children from the Gaza Strip to Israeli hospitals. They were people who were fighting for peace. If you want to start a war, the best way to do it is kill the peacemakers. Let's go to Deuteronomy again. <coughs> Chapter 33. That's the picture, by the way, that maybe changed my mind about what I was going to do today. 33, so. Um, yeah. Deuteronomy 33, and it's verse 33, oh, sorry, 30, it's verse 29. This is the end of those blessings that Moses read out. This is what Israel is supposed to have if they follow the law. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is the shield of your people, of your help, and the sword of your majesty. So your enemies shall cringe before you, and you shall tread on their high places. It was the Israelis who were cringing before their enemies. Mm. They did not have the blessing. We've got in, mm. instead of high places, we've got their bodies. Yeah. Yeah. They've got backs. So we've got backs. Back. Bodies. What verse is that? 33. 33. I have your stock. Uh, 29, sorry, 29. The last verse in 33. So those blessings are not true. There were people covered in their land. There were people treading on their bodies. It's interesting, I saw a news item about how they found some of those bodies. And one of the ways is there were, there were people tracking eagles in Israel. They had trackers on their bodies, on the, on the fly, and the, the eagles. And they were watching on the trackers where the eagles landed. And then they sent the recovery crews there to find the bodies. No. Because the vultures were eating the bodies. That's why they're still finding bodies days afterwards. They're following the trackers. Take a look at your, your notes. There's a bit that says Satan's plan for modern Israel. God has brought Israel in there. God has a plan. So does Satan. And now the, the biggest problem Satan has is firstly he can't destroy Israel completely. He cannot destroy the Jews. Can you remember the story of Job? Where Satan wants to destroy Job and first of all he says, okay, you can take everything he's got away from him but don't touch his body. And then he comes back after it's failed and says, ah, <coughs> flesh for flesh. If you let me attack his body, I'll make him curse you to your face. And God says, okay, but don't kill him. And Satan could not overstep that mark. So Israel, God will occasionally take away his protection, but there's a mark he's put, you cannot destroy them. No. You cannot wipe them out. They are my people. You cannot wipe them out. And so Satan has a problem with that. Now Satan has a, a plan, and that plan started right back in the Tower of Babel. Can you remember the story of the Tower of Babel? Firstly, people got out of the ark, and God gave the instructions, spread out over the world and repopulate it. But when you get to the Tower of Babel, they're saying, let's stay together. Let's build ourselves a city. We don't want to be scattered. We want to build a city up to God. We want to make a name for ourselves. That didn't come from God. That came from Satan. The thing Satan wants is humanity in one place with one government so that he can put his person on top of it. Eventually, that person will be the Antichrist, the son of Satan. Literally, as Jesus is the son of God, Satan wants his son on top of the world political system. But God put a stop to that, and God has been putting a stop to that ever since. Every time Satan comes up with a new empire, a new world power, there's always been those who are strong enough to oppose them. And if you look at the statue there, the golden statue on the left-hand side, the, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, 
if you remember that from Daniel. The golden head was Nebuchadnezzar himself, most glorious of the empires. The silver was the, the Persian Empire, which became stronger but was a different type of empire. Then the bronze, or the brass, was the Greek Empire. Each of these empires got stronger, they got harder, they got mounted. The, the legs of iron was Rome, <coughs> the Roman Empire that took over the world, well, not all the world, there's a, a line across Hadrian's Wall where they didn't get much further than that. They didn't actually manage to take over Persia and places like that. But each time they get stronger and stronger. But then God did the dirty on Satan and he split the Roman Empire in two. The Emperor Constantine split it into the east and the west. And after that, those two sides tended to fight each other. And you have what's called a balance of power. And in, throughout history, World War I, you had the, the Allies on one side, the Axis powers on the other, same in World War II. Nowadays, you, you had East versus West. You had the cold, in, during the Cold War, you had the communist countries versus in the freedom, democracy countries. Then you've got the Christian countries versus Islam. There's always a balance of power. And so God's put that in place so that Satan can never make a one world government. But, but, you know what one of these is? Crowbar. Jolly useful thing. There was a scientist that said once, give me a crowbar or a lever long enough and I could lift the earth. That would be true if you had what's called a fulcrum or a pivot point that's strong enough to do it. If you had a long enough lever and a pivot point strong enough to lift the earth, you could lift the earth. Satan thinks, hmm, how am I going to break this, one, this balance of power? How am I going to stop it? God set it in place, and whatever I do, I can't make one side strong enough to beat the other. I've got to destroy that balance of power. But I need a fulcrum to do it from. That fulcrum is Israel. The reason being is, God will protect the existence of Israel. So let's come up with a cunning plan. Say I get one side or the other in the balance of power to try to utterly destroy Israel. I mean, wipe them off the face of the planet. If I do that, what will God do? What do you think he's going to do? He's going to put a stop to it. So if my lever is hate, is malice, is anti-Semitism, and if I breed it into people so that it is beyond logic, beyond common sense, absolute hatred, and then I get them to attack Israel, what's God going to do to them? He's going to wipe them out. And so if I can wipe out one side or the other of the balance of power, it doesn't matter to me which. If I can do that, then the one world government's back on. The ten toes at the bottom of that statue are the one world government. Satan is trying his hardest to break the balance of power. That particular, the particular battle that does it is in the book of Ezekiel. If you look at the red at the bottom, Ezekiel chapter 30, 38. This, interestingly, is one of the lectionary readings that the ultra-Orthodox read out <coughs> during the... Um, the Feast of Tabernacles on the last day. Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's the description of a battle. It's the description of a battle that has not happened yet. And it's a prophecy given by God, so it will happen at some time in the future. So Ezekiel 38 and I do 1 to 12, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, <coughs> set your face again towards Gog and the land of Magog. Gog, by the way, is not a na uh, real name, it's the name of a title, in the same way Pharaoh is a title. It originally meant mountain or m mighty man. Um, so Gog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, Tubal, and prophesy against them, and say, thus said the Lord, behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and I will turn you about, I will put a hook in your jaw, 
And I will bring you out with all your army and your horsemen and all of them um, splendidly arrayed in great company with buckler and shield and wielding swords. Persia, Ethiopia, put with all of it, uh, with all, all of them with shields and helmets. Goma and all its troops. Beth Togomar, from the remotest parts of the north with all its troops, uh, many people with them. That's a big group of people. Be, prepa uh, be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies, and assemble about, um, about you, uh, and be a guard to them. After many days, you will be summoned in the latter years, and you will come into a land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which have been the continued waste. But its people have been brought out of the nations and they are living securely, all of them. That bit there is a good description of Israel coming back from after the Holocaust. The land of Israel was a desert land. <coughs> Israel have made it bloom. And you will go up, you will come like a storm, and you will be like cl a cloud covering the land, and all your troops and many people with you. Thus says the Lord of God, it will come about on that day that though, um, thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil plan, and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages, I will go up against those who are at rest, and live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars on their gate. If you want to know what those countries are, turn your notes over. Now there is some debate about which countries there are, but some of them are definite. Rosh, for instance, is Russia. It's the land of Russia. Um, Magog um, is the land of Central, uh, Central Asia. Is that possibly not if you look at the map, there's different areas these cover these from. Uh, Magog is to the right of the Caspian Sea, according to this map at any rate, and it's the Russian Muslim republics. So the land where it shows Rush, um, Rosh on there, we now know from the battle in Ukraine, because that's some of the areas they have seized in the Ukrainian war. Now some people say Meshek is actually Moscow. Uh, Tubo is another country, uh, another city in, in, in Russia. This particular group said they're, they're places that were in Turkey, modern day Turkey. These were different areas, different tribes in modern day Turkey. Persia, we know for definite, that's Iran, big friend of Israel. Ethiopia, um, it's probably Sudan nowadays because they, they, they had different names in those days to, to now. Um, I think, is it uh, Sudan? They're firing rockets at Israel? From, from down there. Um, Goma, once again, is possibly a part of Termia, the, Turkey, though I have heard reference to that being East Germany, though I'm not quite sure how they get that one. And many people with you. Oh, and Put is Libya, another place where um, Islamic um, has taken over. And if you look at the map, there's little Israel, and can you see all the lines coming down towards it? That's from all sides. Have you heard uh, President Erdogan of Turkey mm. saying that he has a billion Muslims ready to march on Israel? Russia has recently sold its soul to Iran because they didn't have enough shells and weaponry to attack Ukraine. So they have written a, uh, they've come up with a defence agreement between themselves and Iran. Israel is keeping a very close eye on Iran. In fact, they're being distracted at the moment, obviously, because Iran is trying to make nuclear weapons. And the expert I listened to said that they reckon within six months, Iran will have enough for at least 12 nuclear weapons. Israel has said if they get it, they will attack. At the moment, Israel is fighting on two, yeah. two and a half fronts. Imagine if they find out Iran has it and they send their planes over and bomb Iran. Russia is in Syria, just above Israel. Their troops are in there, they are controlling, they are helping Assad. 
Now, this says that they put a hook in his jaw and drag the leader down, the Gog. He doesn't want to be there. <coughs> Putin does not want to be in Ukraine. He thought he was going to get a quick victory in and out. He's been dragged into a war he didn't want. That's what this type of thing means. So this is a war. Certainly these countries involved, whether this is going to be it or not, I don't know. This is a war with these countries involved when they come on Israel and the, the IDF, the Israel Defence Force, is swept away. At the moment we're looking and we're seeing these professionally trained troops working their way through in a professional manner. They will be wiped off the earth by this enemy attacking them. That's the fulcrum. And Satan's saying, what's God going to do now? If you go over to 39, it's 1 to 8. This is God's reaction. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Mesh, and Dubal, and I shall turn you around and drive you on and take you up from the remotest parts of the north. If you draw a draw straight line from Jerusalem upwards, you come to Moscow, by the way. And bring you against the mountains of Israel, and I shall strike the bow out of your left hand and dash down your arrows out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and your people who are with you. I shall give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall in the open field, for it is, it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God. I shall send fire upon Magog, and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, they will know that I am the Lord, and my holy name shall be made known in the midst of my people Israel, and I shall not let my holy, holy name be profaned any more. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Imagine a world where Russia is taken out of the picture. Russia is humiliated and is no longer a superpower. When Iran and the, many of the ultra-Muslim nations are taken out. Imagine what that will do to world power. And imagine what the, the United Nations, sitting there waving their arms helplessly, you've got to stop everybody, please, you're not being nice, please stop. The United Nations was set up after World War II, this is virtually World War III, a new body is put into place. And if you look at the book of Daniel, this new world order is given sort of ten areas of control, a new United Nations, but a United Nations with teeth, a United Nations that can enforce peace. And when you've got that, then Satan can take his leader and put it in charge. Excuse me, Stephen, can I just um, confirm? Mm -hmm. Are you saying that the fulcrum you call it, the peace of... Is Israel. That's Satan. Satan is using so Israel <coughs> as a way to destroy the balance of power. So, but that um, would more or less include all the Islamic countries, right? Yes, or a lot, a lot of them. So yes. There are Islamic countries in, in this, because it talks about um, Sheba and others yeah. in the distance saying, hey, what are you up to? So that's Saudi Arabia. So there are Islamic countries that are not against Israel in this particular case. So are you saying there's the balance? Yeah. There's always the balance? Yeah, that so balance will be broken. balance will be broken. Yes. And what will be left will develop into ten... Yes. Kings, ten nations. Yes. There is a group called um, the, the Club of Rome that for years has been coming up with a, a one world government system and breaking the world into ten different regions and each, <coughs> each answering separately. And you can imagine after something like this, after a battle that ends so dramatically, that that would happen. The other thing is, God says people will know my name after this and they'll respect me. Imagine what's going to happen to world religion. Russia, East, uh, Russian Orthodox, Muslims, Islam, all get their butts whipped by the God of Israel. What's going to happen to world religion? Most are going to believe in him. 
There will certainly be a, a coming back to God, but Satan can soon change that. Let's yes, come to a one world religion, but he can soon manipulate that. <coughs> Them, they all be afraid of him rather than worship yeah. at that point. Now, if you can see, there's a line of dominoes on my picture there. A line of dominoes. You've seen dominoes, haven't you, when they set them all up and they press one domino at the end? Uh, can you see the guy with a bit of the, the moustache, the impressive moustache? Who knows who he is? Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Do you know what's special about him? The shot that echoed around the world. He was shot um, by a Croatian in Serbia, I think, somewhere like that. And there were all these uh, treaties between various different countries. And all those treaties, so it's like a domino falling one after the other after the other, which started World War Three or World War One, World War One. The attack by Hamas was so vicious, yeah. so evil, and I look and think, why would they do that? Why would they be so horrific? And I think the idea is Satan's pushing over a domino, the first domino in the line. <coughs> and you're looking at all the other Islamic countries around the world, which are now up in arms. And they're, they're, they're spitting blood and teeth. Is this the first domino in a line that leads to this battle? It might be. This war has yet to come. All the participants in this war are lined up around Israel at the moment and speaking fire and death against them. Russia doesn't want to be involved, but it is involved because it's sold its soul out. At the moment also the rest of the world is all horrible towards Israel and, this, and most of yeah. the side of Palestine. Yeah. It's strange, the, the malice against Israel is strange. I've seen a, a picture of these young women with makeup on in a free country, walking down, waving a flag in a thing against, uh, a protest against Israel, they're waving the Taliban flag. So women wearing makeup without head coverings, yeah. waving the Taliban flag. There's a group which had queers for Palestine in a big banner. <laughs> Yeah, if you went to, even the, even the gay people in Israel were saying, they would kill you on the spot in any country. Israel is interestingly the only country in the Middle East which allows gay people any rights. So in the point of view of Western democracy, Western modern society, Israel's our only friend out there. Yes. And yet even those people over here who demand those rights are against them. Yeah. None of it makes any it's sense. Demonic, isn't it? Yes, it's demonic. It's a crowbar. It's hatred. Satan has been building up hatred for years and years and years, and he's using that. I mean, after, that, that, really. yeah. after that assault that day, we had people marching in our streets mm -hmm. pro Palestinian after that terrible. Yeah. Before Israel had done anything. Yeah. Before, it's all, all Israel's fault for being alive. I know you've got to go in a minute because you've got to catch your train, so go when, go when you want to. We'll go on to God's plan because that's the next bit. God's plan. Let's go to Romans. If you want to know God's plan for Egypt, not Israel, Romans 9, 10 and 11 give you the clue. Romans 9, 10 and 11. We'll go to Romans chapter, uh, chapter 11. I'll be as quick as I can because I've gone over, I see already. So Romans eleven twenty five to the uh, to thirty two. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed for the, of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimations, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The word fullness there means the, the, the full number. So Israel has been hardened until the full number of Gentiles come in and then they will return. And thus all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob and this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins for the st uh, from the standpoint 
from so the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God, choice, uh, God, God of choice, they are beloved for the sake of the Father. And the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient in order that because of the mercy shown to you, they shall also now be shown mercy. For God has shut them up in disobedience that he might show mercy to all. The Isaiah passage, it says, God has written the name of Israel on the palms of his hand. He will not forget them. In Jeremiah, it says that the offspring of Israel will never be destroyed if you can get rid of the sun, if you can get rid of the stars, if you can get rid of the seas, if you can get rid of all of those, then I will forget my promise. But while those happens, I will remember my promise to Israel, they will never be forgotten. In Revelations, there's 144,000 witnesses. God sends his angels out to find those people who are still loyal to him in the earth. There's 144,000 left. Jews. They're all Jews. Every single one of them. There's a minor matter of something called the rapture in the meantime, which might explain for a few people not being present, but that's all the people on the earth who are loyal to God. They are Jews. They might even be old <coughs> Orthodox Jews. But they're the only ones, and they will be the ones who preach to the earth. In Daniel, God promises, God's talking to Daniel, and he's showing him these visions of this horror of this one world government. And he says that it will not end until the power of the holy people has been shattered. At the moment, Israel is the strongest country in that part of the Middle East. But by the end of these events, not after this, after the, the Battle of Gog and Magog and other events, they will be shattered. They will be out of their land again. They will be in pieces. And it's then when they are in pieces that God will take them. Not when they're in the strength of their pride. Not when they think they're strong. Not when it's men of violence trying to fulfill the vision of God. But when they're shattered. When the people who are left call upon him. The sheep and the goats, Matthew 25. When, the Bible says there, when the Son of Man comes with his angels in his glory, and he's sitting, and where's he sitting? You see the picture at the bottom? That's Jesus on the Mount of Olives, overlooking Jerusalem. I think he sets up his throne on the Mount of Olives, because that's where he comes to. And the nations are put in that valley in between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. That's the Mount of Kidron. So those nations that have survived the, the final battles, Battle of Armageddon, are there. And they are judged. What are they judged on? They are judged on what they did to Jesus' brothers. Not his physical brothers, but his Jewish brothers. And the nations will say, you, you helped them, you fed them, you clothed them, you looked after them, you tried to protect them with what was going on in the world. Remember Corrie ten Boom who hid the Jews? So with the evil in the world, you tried to help, come in. You lot, you chased them down, you gave them up, you betrayed them. Hell, Go. The judgment of the world is based on their behaviour against <coughs> the Jews. Let's go to the Song of Moses. Deuteronomy 32. This is the song that Moses taught the people, which tells them all of this. This is what it tells them. If you behave, I will protect you, I will be with you. Deuteronomy 32, 43, one verse. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. 
He will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. That's the last word of the Son of Moses. He will bring justice. The last title I've got, Responsibility of the Church. Have you heard the expression, praying for the peace of Jerusalem? <laughs> it comes from that particular psalm. Psalm, psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace does not mean an absence of war. This is how we think of it. Peace means an absence of debt. There's no debt between you and God. You know the first time the word peace appears in the Bible? It's when God is speaking to Abraham. He's, he's showing him the prophecies of what will happen in the future. And he says to him, but you, you will go to your fathers in peace. First time the word shalom appears in the Bible is to do with death. And you will go, when you die, you will be in peace. You will go to your fathers. There's an absence of debt. There's an absence of judgment. The peace of Jerusalem is when the debt is paid and when God sets up the kingdom on earth through Jesus. Isaiah 62, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They will not hold their peace day or night until you make Jerusalem a praise. That's angels, literally, on the, the walls of Jerusalem, but it's also the people praying, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, praying for the day when their debt is paid, when God can fulfil his promises. Interestingly, in Deuteronomy... In those passages we read, it talks about God making the Jewish people jealous by a, a nation, by a group of people who are not a nation. They're not a people and they're not a nation, which is a very good description of Christians, because we're not a nation and we're not particularly one race. God wants to make Israel jealous of the Christians. And from what I hear from one particular uh, Jewish teacher, more Jews have been turned to Christ by talking to Gentiles than have necessarily been talked to turned by Jews. Because the Jews say, well, how come this person is looking at my scripture and has got something special that I haven't got? And so God is actually making the Jewish people jealous by Christians. And that's said again in Romans. In Romans, Paul, Paul mentions it in Romans. The gospel is to the Jew first and also the Gentile. The good news about Jesus is to the Jew first. Let's go to the last one, just to, to Romans chapter 11. We'll make this the last one. I'm afraid this could go on for hours and hours, and I have gone on far too long. I've skipped bits I should have said, and I haven't said things I should have done. Romans chapter 11. So this is Paul talking to the Romans, who were Gentiles, about the Jews. I say then, he did, um, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgressions, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them, um, to make them jealous. It, if their transgression be riches to the world and their failure be riches to the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfilment be. I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move them to jealousy, my fellow countrymen, and save some of them, if their rejection be reconciliation for the world, what would their acceptance be but life from the dead? And if the first piece of the dough be holy, the lump will also um, and the root be holy and the branches too. Well, I won't go into that. But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in amongst them, then you uh, have become partakers with them of the rich roots of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the roots, but the root supports you. You will say, the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off 
for unbelief, but you stand by the faith. But do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Behold then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what by natural is a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? We'll cut on to the end. 33. Satan has a plan. He is working on his plans, but God is working on his. God's also putting dominoes in place. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or become his counsellor? Or who has first given to him that he might pay them back to him again? And from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory for ever and ever. Israel is not just another country. <coughs> it is a battleground between Satan and God. It is the, the battleground that this world will be judged on. What is happening over there now? You can't say, am I on Israel's side or am I on Palestine's side? The question is, are you on God's side? God will bring judgment on his own people. God is the one who judges, not man. And he is looking on and he is seeing all that's happening. In human terms, how could you decide what's right? How can you say bomb, uh, attacking a hospital and killing children is right? But at the same time, you can say, hold on, but they're doing this and they're doing that, and there's all this and there's all that. And, there's all... and in human terms, our <coughs> brains, but from the point of view of God, he's looking on. And he will judge and he will bring all to judgment in the end. And we might not be able to understand it, but our job is to pray for Israel. To pray for peace. And in the Palestinians, to pray for peace. A lack of, a lack of debt before God. Because our death, when you die, if you have peace with God, you go to him. And it doesn't matter. It's a very complicated subject and I have done a miserable job in trying to explain it to you in a short time. We'll end with a word of prayer. Father, you know all things. You know what Satan is planning. Although most of the time we fall into his trap straight away. Lord, you know where this is going. Lord, may we look to you. If this is indeed the start of the end, then Lord, help us. Help us to do the job you have put us on this earth for. To spread your gospel. To pray for your people and for the peace of Jerusalem. To pray for those who are perishing. That they may find peace with you. And that you may save those of this world that can be saved. Amen. And Amen. Bit of a long one, I do apologise.